we'll pray and begin. Father God, we look to you because you are the one who have redeemed us, you have purchased us, and we belong to you. Father God, we ask that as we continue to follow through in this walk and continue to, to seek after you, Lord, with our hearts and souls, that you will continue to give us insight, direct our lives. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to, to direct, direct us in the way of righteousness, in the way of holiness. We have honesty before you, and Lord, we ask that you would continue to mold and shape us according to your purpose, by your design. We thank you, Lord. Amen. So tonight, we're looking at uh, the review, which is on page 22. So page 22 is the review, the review of what we've looked at in Torah 2. So I think, I believe we went through Torah, Torah 2 fairly quickly. The hope is to get the review done tonight and get the study guide, the study guides that we have left. I think we have one and a half study guides uh, left to be done. At any rate, we'll figure that out as we go, but uh, we do have a, a review to do tonight, and I'm going to start off by handing out books. This book, these books are History 1 and 2. So tonight, well, next, next week, we begin a new course in history, too. That one? All right. A new course in history, one and two. Every, yes, that's, yeah. Actually, you got two courses here, but, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. You have one. Okay, go ahead. How are we doing? We do have a number, number of people that's in the class missing. Who, who else is missing? Mm. Yes. Oh, you gonna share one? Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Class, class six. Review, and so I have, I have uh, six Hebrew words up on the board, and we did do six classes in this course. Most of the, course ha most of the courses have seven classes. This one has six. So the first word, of course, it's right up there on the board, mitzvah. Mitzvah is commandment. Chata, which is sin, the second. Torah, which is instructions. Shema, which is to hear. Kohen, which is priest. And midbah, midbah, which is wilderness. So if you follow that, that's basically more or less the themes that we looked at in this, in this uh, Torah too. All right, let's begin our review. We don't need to spend too much time on the review. I think we can move through fairly quickly and wrap up our study guides tonight. All right, so the story of uh, the story of of the Exodus, the book of Exodus, begins with the children of Israel going into Egypt, and specifically they settled in the land of Goshen, which as we've talked about before, is the region of Lower Egypt, which is, basic, which is basically a delta that meets the Mediterranean Ocean. So the source of the Nile is Mount Kilimanjaro, um, Victoria Falls specifically, that comes from Mount Kilimanjaro, which is way down here. And that source of water works, it, works its way through uh, Africa, the eastern part of Africa, and all the way up through Egypt, and ends up in the Mediterranean. And so that area up there is a delta. It's called a delta, shaped like a triangle. 
and that's Goshen. That's where Israel was kept captivity for 400 years, and it was, in fact, a good place to be kept in captivity relative to the rest of northern Africa, which was, by and large, arid and very dry and desert. So Israel prospered in that place, even though it was a place of bondage. And the Jewish people in the, in the diaspora, especially the, the ones who settled in Spain, Portugal, and, and most currently in this country, uh, have settled in fruitful places, yet they're places of bondage, sort of like Goshen. And so the terrain, like we talked about, the terrain of Goshen, Egypt, but Goshen is very lush, very fertile, lots of, uh, lots of, uh, lots, lots of fish, vegetables, and so on. And so life there was good from that point of view. Now, we talked about that uh, Israel is a type in understanding God's purpose for our lives. We can see Israel from that point of view, uh, meaning Goshen was a place of perhaps plenty, a place of, of, of abundance, but the, it was also a place of sin, a bondage, where they were under the yoke of slavery and bondage. And that can relate to us in our lives. Some of us, well, not all of us, but some of us lived in the world, lives of plenty. Well, most of us, we certainly had the position to go out and seek to, to receive plenty in, 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 in the state of bondage that we were in. And so, so it was with Israel. Israel cried out, as, as we would do, from, from, from the burden of sin. And God provided a Passover lamb, and we know the story. The, the gods of Israel, the plagues were sent to humble the gods of Israel. The final, the final plague was the Passover the angel of death that passed over. Well, the Passover lamb, of course, as it relegates to this picture, this, this type that we are, is, of course, Jesus. Then the Red Sea, the red crossing of the Red Sea, leaving the enemy behind, that relegates or that relates to water baptism, Mount Sinai, Holy Spirit baptism. We talked about this quite a bit. Kiddush Barnea is a place of possible distra distraction in the life of the believer. Not every believer would experience distractions. Many of us do. But for Israel, this was a place of definite distraction and a change of God's purpose and direction in their lives. Not purpose, but directions. Wandering in the wilderness sometimes because of a, a error or because of a distraction, we can end up wandering in the wilderness like Israel, do, like Israel did. And ultimately, God was faithful. God is faithful. And he brought Israel to the promised land, and they crossed over the Jordan and received the promise, the promised land. So there is a type here or an allegorical picture here of what, what we as believers may experience or should experience to some degree in our lives. We all, we all begin in a place of bondage where we're mired in sin, and sometimes that place is, is a place that we feel like we can't do without. It's a place of plenty. It's a place of, 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 of the flesh. And, and, if, and if God is gracious, we'll come to a place where we would say, no, this is not for me. I need to get out of this. I need deliverance. And we will cry out, and God has already provided uh, the Passover, the lamb, so that the angel of death would pass over and we would not experience eternal death. And then, of course, water baptism. I think we've all experienced water baptism from there, you, you should experience or can experience uh, Mount Sinai, which is symbolic of Holy Spirit baptism, which we should all have. We should all have that testimony of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the, the point of being filled with the Holy Spirit, Mount Sinai, is to be empowered to go out into God's purpose. And that's where the distractions may begin. As we begin to go out, and discover God's purpose for us, that's where the devil would seek to distract us. And he uses fear, very typical with the ten spies. They, they, they embraced fear, and of course they were permanently distracted. And then ultimately, if we persevere and endeavor, we will come into God's purpose as Israel came into the land of Israel. All right, so there's that, that typology there, that very important picture there for us. 
And then, then let's talk about the deliverance. Uh, of course, I just, I just talked about some of that. Uh, ultimately, uh, ultimately, God will bring deliverance in the life of, of the believer, just as he ultimately did with Israel. So we did talk about that some. Deliverance comes as we begin to recognize bondage, as Israel recognized their bondage and they cried out, and God would send a deliverer, someone that will stand in the place of God that will, in fact, effect deliverance. Uh, we talked about the office of Messiah and that Moses was a type of Messiah. He was prophet, priest, and king. We talked about that. I think, I think you should remember that. Prophet, priest, and king Moses was. You say king, well, he was functioning effectively as uh, in God's stead over the people of Israel, so he was, in fact, a king. God ultimately is the king of Israel. Moses functioned in the stead of God. And so he was king, prophet, and certainly he was a priest. He was of the tribe of Levi. Remember that we said that God ultimately, uh, or originally I should say, didn't intend to give Aaron the priesthood. He intended that the priesthood would all, the priesthood would be in the hands of Moses. And Moses would be a, a fine and individual, singular representation of a picture of Messiah, prophet, priest, and king. It was all for Moses. But then, after, after Moses complained the third time, effectively, God said, okay, then I'll send Aaron who will stand in your place, and he will speak on your behalf. So then Aaron was given the office of priest. All right, and there's some conjecture there, but I believe it's true. I believe that God originally called Moses to fill that important picture, to fill that important role of Messiah, prophet, priest, and king. There are a couple of uh, opportunities that Moses had to complete this wonderful picture of himself being Messiah that he, uh, he blew. This one, of course, he, he, he didn't fulfill his, his, because of his lack of faith, he didn't fulfill his, his, the possibility of him being that perfect picture of Jesus. And also at, uh, at Horeb, where he struck the rock. And that was another example of him uh, just dropping the ball and doing something that created a, a bad picture, another, another picture that God wanted. All right, and then uh, Israel, Israel requested an uh, uh, intermediator between themselves and God. God always intended to send a savior for Israel, a messiah, a, a Moshiach, an anointed one. Moses was the type of the anointed one. The whole prospect, the whole, the whole reality of, of his name being Moshe, which is derived from the word Moshiach, because he came from the water. He was taken from, and so there's a, there's a, a, a sense of, of Moshiach in that anointed one. And so, so Moses was this, supposed to be this picture of Messiah. But at Mount Sinai, Israel decided that they wanted an intermediator, someone who would stand between God and them. They didn't want to come close to the mountain. We talked about, uh, about Sinai, their experience at Sinai, which was the first, the first Sukkot, no, excuse me, Shavuot. That experience was supposed to be something of a wedding, a union between God and Israel. God intended to be a husband to Israel, as he said in Jeremiah chapter 31. At Sinai, he intended to be a husband, and they chose to stay far off. And so the union was never really initiated. As a result, the office of Messiah was, was taken to, an, to another, le another level, a level of intermediator, which Moses fulfilled. And so Jesus is, of course, the, 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 the Messiah, the one who would fill that office completely. So we know that the true judge of Israel, the only judge of Israel, ultimately is Messiah Jesus, uh, the one who was appointed, the word of God, who was appointed by God to, to shepherd Israel, ultimately. Um, and he still is today, nothing has changed regardless of their acceptance of him or the church's understanding of who he is, doesn't change anything. He is still the anointed one that will, in fact, uh, cover the people of Israel. 
So we, we, looked, we took some time and we looked at the fact that God intends to dwell in the midst of his creation, specifically to dwell in the midst of Israel. So the body of people that's Israel, that constitutes Israel, is sort of God's dwelling place. Uh, is God's dwell, will be God's dwelling place, I should say. But the temple is where he will abode, where he will abide. That will be his abode. But the temple is placed in the midst of Israel. So God intended for Israel to build for him a temple that would be placed squarely in the midst of them. That's why in the wilderness, the tabernacle was surrounded by three tribes on all sides because the body of, the body of Israel, the people of Israel, were to function as a habitat for the tabernacle, which was God's dwelling place. So in effect, Israel would be his dwelling place. All right. so, so God intended from the very beginning to dwell in the midst of his creation, in the midst of Israel. Okay, we have a bird in here. So we looked at the tabernacle, all of the factors of the tabernacle, that the tabernacle was divided into two components, the holy place and the holy of holies. And that the holy place uh, painted a picture or, or became a representation of Jesus himself, or more, more, more correctly, the ministry of Jesus was represented in the holy place. The holy of holies is a representation of God's throne. Above the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, the Hakaporet, in Hebrew, in Hebrew the Hakaporet being the, the throne of God, where God would sit, where he would sit and reign. We also, we also began to look at the reality that, that there will be a living temple, that God will establish a living temple, that the tabernacle in the wilderness, Solomon's temple were all types of the living temple, but, which is the church, but the church itself is a picture of what God will ultimately do, which is establish the ultimate temple, the final temple, which is the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem is that temple made ready like a bride for her husband, the Lamb of God in that sense. And so the New Jerusalem is the ultimate temple. And the tabernacle was a type of that New Jerusalem. Picturing, of course, that in the final, in the final creation where the new Jerusalem is established, you have the throne of God, you have the ministry of Jesus working, working together. When, when, the, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent in two, symbolizing that, that, the, that the office of Messiah was then enacted at that point, where there's no division between Jesus and God, the ministry was effected. And that's what the New Jerusalem would be like. All right, let's talk about faith and God's servant. We're talking here, of course, about Moses. What is the faith message at Kadesh Barnea? What is, the, what is the essence of what we saw at Kadesh Barnea? Trust God. Consider all that he has done when we come to an impasse an impasse in our lives relative to faith, we look back and see all that he has done. And that's what, we, that's what, that's what happened at Kadesh Barnea. That's what we see at Kadesh Barnea. The children of Israel did not consider the wonders in the wilderness, what he had already done on their behalf. And so suddenly they're not walking in faith. They're not considering his, his miracles. They're walking by sight. They entered from the south, which is just around the southern part of the Negev, just about, and they entered in from the south, and they went north into the land. The land was attractive. Uh, the Negev probably wasn't as, uh, as dry as it was, as it is now, then. And so they, they were impressed with the land. The land was flowing with milk and honey and so on, but there were giants, and we know the story well. And so their faith failed them or they failed to walk in faith and didn't trust God and of course they transgressed against God. So the, the faith story at Kadesh Barnea is very simple. Whenever we come to a place of difficulty where we're faced with giants, 
we look back at the wonderful things that God has done and we believe him. We trust him. Now, if, if you do not have a record of, of faith events in your life, that makes it a little more difficult. But God is faithful even then to give you the, the pattern of the Red Sea experience, to give you a, 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 a reality of faith that's profound enough to keep you and to carry you over. But he does want, he does want us to believe and not waver in faith. And so our Kadesh Barnea experience is usually later on in our walk, as we continue to walk in the Lord, as we continue to obey Him and serve Him, there would invariably come situations that will challenge us. That time, at that time is when we say, God, you did all those wonderful things in our lives. You, you look back and you see where He was faithful every step of the way, and so you have every reason to stand in faith. And that's really the essence of the faith experience at Kedesh Barnea. Now in the wilderness, what happened? They wanted, uh, they wanted meat, right? They, wanted, they didn't want the manna anymore. The manna had become uh, too, too common for them. They had lost their, 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 their sense of wow about manna. Manna was being provided supernaturally by God. It was everything they needed, right? Nothing was missing from it nutritionally to, to sustain them. But suddenly they're wanting more than the, man, the manna. They, they want meat. And they were asking for quails, specifically. You know, they, they wanted quails. So it's a little quail with the manna beaks or the manna cakes would be good. And so they cried out, they wanted quails, and so God gave them quails. And then what, what comes as a result of their lack of God? What happens? He sent fiery serpents. And, and what happened? They were stung by the serpents, and God provided the, the bronze serpent, serpents uh, that they would look upon and would be healed. That's a story here. How can we relegate that to our own experience? Or do we have to? How do we feel? Okay. So Moses lifted up a staff in the wilderness for Israel to look upon. I think also the essence of that is when you're in a place of despair, God will make really clear and visible for you, lifting up, his salvation. He would make it obvious and you won't, you won't be able to miss it. If you cry out, if you're in that place of desperation, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So the, the, the essence there of being lifted up pertains to being able to see him, being able to make eye contact with him in a spiritual sense. So the staff being lifted up in the wilderness, think about, think about two million people, a, a, a horde of two million people, and they're being attacked by serpents. Well, you can have a, you can have the you can have the staff with the super bronze serpents at your at your hands, and you're not they're not going to see it. They had to see it. So that in order for them to see it, it had to be lifted up, so that the mass of Israel could see the staff, the golden the golden uh, serpents, bronze serpents. Well, that's the point with Israel. But uh, excuse me, with Jesus, if he be lifted up. He will draw all men unto him because all men will see him. Not literally to see, but to perceive, would be able to perceive him. Or, or, or come to the cross, in other words. And that's, that's the significance of that. Now, him being lifted up doesn't mean that every, every human being would, in fact, come to the cross. It means that he's available for everyone to come to the cross. When, when the serpents were lifted up in the wilderness... It didn't mean that every Israelite would look upon it and trust God, but it meant that God provided the means by which they could be, they could be delivered and they can have life. All right. We talked about God's covenant with Israel. We spent two classes on that subject. What are the requirements, two requirements of Israel? What, what did God require of the nation of Israel? 
to hear his voice and obey him. It's really that simple. Now, to obey him means that they would obey the Torah, the commandments. Receive his instructions, hear, receive his instructions, and obey his instructions. Of course, the Torah involves 613 laws, statutes, and commandments, a code of law that would sustain them and keep them throughout their experience in the land of Israel. You know, Israel and the diaspora, what, were, what was one of the factors that kept Israel in the diaspora? The Talmud. The Torah, but the Talmud was their expansion of the Torah. So in the diaspora, for 2,000 years just about, the, the law, the halakha, the law, the, he, the Jewish law, which involved the Torah, of course, the Talmud, kept Israel, gave them a, a, a guideline, a standard by which they can live. Well, the law, the instructions, God's law, was intended to do that for Israel as they came into the land of Israel. God never intended for the law to be applicable outside of the land of Israel. He and all the land of Israel. So the law of the Torah was for their benefit as they would live in the land of Israel. Unfortunately, we know the story. We know the story well. Israel was not faithful and, would, and they were driven out. The two requirements, to receive, to hear, to receive God's law, his instructions, and to obey. All right, it says here, the second part of that section, progressive difficulty, responsibility, opportunity of God's covenant. Uh, Abraham, uh, Moses, Messiah. All right. I'm not real sure what Pastor Ken was looking for there specifically, but I believe he was looking at, at the development of, of the, the promises from Abraham to Moses, then to Messiah. I, I believe that's what he's looking for. And we did spend a little time talking about this, not so much about as it relates to Messiah. So the covenant that God established or cut with Abraham was furthered or carried over to Israel. It was a valid covenant with Abraham. It, it worked well for him, his two sons, well, actually his one son and his grandson, uh, Yahakov. Ishmael and, and Esau were not factors in that covenant. The, the factors in the covenant was, in fact, Isaac and, and Yaakov. But then it also relegated or related to the descendants of, of, of Israel or Yaakov. And so that's what happened at Sinai with Moses. So you have Abraham, Moses, and then we haven't spent much time talking about the covenant as it relates to Jesus, which we will in this course in history as we begin to study history. All right, now law and sacrifices. And this is the last class that we did. We spent a couple, a couple uh, sessions there. We talked about the purpose of the law. What was the purpose of the law? To keep Israel, uh, to keep Israel honest. <laughs> to keep them functional before God. A viable vessel of God's manifestation. Uh, the law was, was that factor that will keep them focused, keep them engaged in carrying out the work of the kingdom. So the law actually has a purpose, not just orderly living, but to sustain the people of Israel for the work of the kingdom. Now, the law was given at Sinai. Sinai was a Shavuot-type experience. At Shavuot, Pentecost, with the church, God gave the church the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was an empowerment for the service for the work of the kingdom. So what's... What's the comparison between God intending to put his law within the people of Israel and the Holy Spirit on the church, in a, the church having an internal experience with the Holy Spirit? Why are they comparable? In other words, Jesus said in chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit is with you, has been with you, but soon will be in you. And so roughly 50 days after, said that, 51 days after he said that, the believers, the church, had an internal experience with God's Holy Spirit, and that was the empowerment for them to go out and function and be effective in God's kingdom. 
At Sinai, the Shavuot experience at Sinai was that Israel would receive the law internally and that would be an empowerment for them to go out and serve God. So what does the law and the Holy Spirit have in common in that sense? Empowerment, yeah. But why is the Holy Spirit in, 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 this, in this symbolism comparable to the receiving of the law internally? That's what God intended for Israel to receive at Sinai. All right, he said that in, in Jeremiah chapter 31, that they will all know him because they will all, he will put his law, his Torah within them. What did at Sinai will happen in the future. So why is the law and the baptism of the Holy Spirit seemingly connected or related? It all keeps together, it keeps God's power. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit and also the legalism of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you follow the law and the Spirit, you're combining them. So for Israel, God wanted them as a body of people to receive his Torah, his instructions within them. They didn't because they refused to draw near to him and to have that experience as a, as a people. Now, the, some of the Levites did experience it. The 70 elders that went up on the mountain, they did experience it. Now, he, here's what I believe. I believe that it's as Jesus said, okay, so the Holy Spirit has been sent to convict the world of sin and righteousness. Righteousness there has to do with what God determines to be right or righteous. The Holy Spirit is sent into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, if someone has God's law instilled within them, instilled within them, it should have the same effect. So it's the same, effectively the same experience. But for the church, upon a group of people who didn't relegate their lives or did not discipline their lives in Torah necessarily upon them and, and, and fill them internally. Peter was not necessarily Torah observant to some extent. He may have been, but he was, a, he was very much a man of the flesh. On the day of Pentecost, that changed. Instantly, he went from, uh, you know, wavering Peter, you know, skittish Peter, Peter who really wanted to go fishing, basically, uh, to Peter who wanted to get up and preach. Transformation instantly because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Of course, the baptism of the Holy Spirit brings more than convicted, conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's also an empowerment in that. And so you have the same comparison between Israel at Sinai to receive God's law internally and the church receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit internally as well. So look at it this way. Each one of the 120 believers at, 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 at Pentecost, at Shavuot in Jerusalem, each one of them is comparable to the entire body of Israel at Sinai. And if the entire body of Israel, the two million people, had cleaved to the mountain, then they would have had that experience as a people. And they would have been empowered to go out and serve God, but they did not. So, all right, purpose of the law. All right, so spiritual fulfillment versus legalistic fulfillment. Many times uh, you encounter people, especially in the Hebraic roots movement and the quote-unquote messianic movement that are hyper-legalistic. And it's, it's incredibly unfortunate that they are, they're, they're that way. They're wearing zitzis and yarmulke, they're, you know, they... They do all those things, they dress with a white shirt, a black pants on the Shabbat. They, they, you know, they, do, they do things that are not necessarily biblically inspired, and they believe that they're being obedient to God on some level. It's, it's like, it's like you know, just sort of legalistically and traditionally obeying God, using tradition. Uh, legalism never in, never in any way at all uh, glorifies God, never does. It may look good on the surface, you know. It may look, it may look quite attractive on the surface. Zitzis, yamika, learn Hebrew, speak like a sabra, 
do all those things and it's impressive to look at, but the reality is there's no faith in it. If it's legalistic, if it's just being done simply because you believe that by doing this, somehow you will attain to some special position of righteousness, holiness, acceptance, acceptance, then, then it's legalism. What was that? Huh? Yeah. Well, you can, you can, uh, faith has to come from the Word of God. It has to be established from the Word of God. And it also has to be established internally by the Holy Spirit. So if you're, if you're doing things because you've seen other people do it, or there's a sense of compulsion that comes from, you know, tradition, then you're not really God. You know, Jesus had a in his heart for tradition, and it wasn't a good place. He didn't have any love for tradition. In fact, he reviled the Pharisees many, many times for their traditions, traditions that are outside of the dictates of the Bible or outside of the the Torah, which is what we get. I, I witnessed many, many times people getting wrapped up in program to, to shove people around. That's a different type of legalism. That's a very aggressive, offensive legalism. That I've witnessed before, and that's hideous, even more hideous. What I talked about before is just people getting wrapped up in tradition and being hyper -legal. And willing to, to willing to hold themselves up because they're above in some way people are not. It's legalism, right? But taking the very Torah, the very law of God, and using it as a means by which you can condemn other people who are not doing exactly what you are doing, well that's legalism on a whole different level. And I believe that's even worse. I believe it's it's a little more hideous to God when people do the second. Tradition. Right. Those things become, they become objects of faith, like the talit, the, the uh, tefillin, you know, they do it because the Torah says it, but for them, it's really more about tradition. This is what we do. We do this three times a day. And so, uh, to, for a Jewish person, I'm not going to speak to that. That's what they do. That's their particular faith. But I, I'm speaking here relative to Christians. We, are, as Christians, we're supposed to walk in the Spirit, and to obey God in the Holy Spirit by faith, hearing and obeying. Around, around these, uh, concerning these Messianic type churches and, and Hebraic, root, Hebraic root churches, there's a lot of, I'm doing this because that's what they're doing. There's a whole lot of, the rabbi says that this is what you have to do, and so he wears, he has his, his what do you call these things, and he's wearing a yarmulke, and he dances a certain way, and so that's, that's what we do. When I first came here, um, I, some of the men were wearing zitzis. And I said, mm, zitzis, I wonder, I wonder if I'm supposed to do that. It seems to be the thing that everyone is doing. And so I got some zitzis, and I came in here on a Shabbat, and boy, the Holy Spirit scolded me. As soon as I walked in, I had that, that, that prompting from the Holy Spirit that says, why are you wearing zitzis, really? And the only answer I had was because other people are wearing them. And he basically said, I am your zitzis. I am sent to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the zitzis, that's how the zitzis came into being, to convict, to, 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 re, to be reminded of sin, what's right, and what can, what can be judgment. 
So he said, I'm your, I'm your zitsis, and so I'm no zitsis for me. Another time I, I approached Ken, I said, you know, I'm, I'm having to work Shabbats about twice a month, and it's really annoying me, and, and, and I really feel like I should approach my, my manager and tell him I'm not working Shabbats henceforth. And um, I said, what do you think I should do? You think I should? What do you think? What do you think? And he said, well, why don't you pray about it? I expected him to say, definitely tell your employer that you're not working Shabbats. All right? We're Shabbat observant here. But he said, pray, pray about it. And I looked at him, and he knew I was puzzled. He said, this is a faith issue. You don't, you don't do it because I'm doing it. You do it because the Holy Spirit told you to do it. And, of course, that took the burden off of him and put the burden on me where it belonged. And so I had to pray about it, and I sought God's face. Within, I would say within three or four months, uh, my, my employer made it optional for me to be there on a Saturday. I would set up the shop for the guys on a Friday, and they would come in and do what they had to do. So God, God has a way of answering prayer when, when it's done from the place of faith. And that's, that's the trouble with legalism. It, it, it cancels faith. Because if you're doing it on the basis of just a routine rigor of observance, there's no faith. There's no faith. And that's, that's the problem with legalism. Now, legalism does not only exist in the Messianic movement or in the Hebraic root movement. It exists in many facets of Christianity. It exists in Catholicism. I mean, that's legalism right there. Even in the Protestant church, there's legalism. In the Pentecostal church, there's tremendous legalism. It's always there, all right? Now, 50, 60 years ago, the Pentecostal church, the holiness Pentecostal church, the women had to wear, you know, shirts up to their wrist and up to their neck. They couldn't reveal certain parts of their legs. And that was holiness Pentecostal, Pentecostalism. And that's the way the Pentecostal church functioned way back then. But things have changed. The latter rain movement, the charismatic movement, and this movement, that movement, and so today, the Pentecostal church is unrecognizable compared to what it was before. You go to some of these Pentecostal churches, especially the African-American Pentecostal churches, and women are dressed to attract. You know, they, they, it's not like it used to be, but what can happen in even that environment, here's how legalism can work in that environment. If, if, the, if half of the church, for instance, you go to uh, I'm not going to pick on the African-American churches necessarily, but if you go to a Pentecostal church that's, that's, um, that's African-American and you don't fit into the mold of what's expected, you're going, to be, you're going to be ostracized. Same thing with any Pentecostal church, even today. Now, the, now today's modern Pentecostal evangel evangelistic churches a whole, different, a whole different scene altogether. It's a whole different setup than what it was before. Now it's very, it's <laughs> postmodern. Uh, you're expected to conduct yourself in a certain way. You're expected to, for instance, something as silly and as trivial as we would think of not showing up with a Bible, but showing up with this. And if, in fact, you do need to read the Bible, which is rare, you can just, you know, you have it right here. So there's a sense of legalism there that you're looked down upon if you're walking around with your Bible. You know, you're like this. You're so 1980s. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. Go find a church where you can talk your Bible. I mean, that sounds absurd, right? But you go to some of these churches, and that's what you get. And it's exactly legalism. It is man taking, man taking his traditions and applying it to issues that should only be faith, come from a place of faith, and setting an order in place. Legalism. Legalism has never in any way at all glorified God. It has always formed religious movements. And that's what it does.
That's amazing, huh? <laughs> and that's, you know, that's, that's why I say that you go to some of these postmodern churches and it's unrecognizable. You know, I haven't gone to the new church over here where the Scottish Rite Temple used to be. You know, the Scottish Rite Temple, the Freemason Scottish Rite, which is basically Freemasonry, but of a different degree, a higher degree. So they had their temple, you know, Scottish, the Scottish Rite movement is basically, you get to a certain level in the Freemason order, and you can't go any further, then you become Scottish Rite. So the Scottish Rite over there had their temple next to the Freemason temple, and I guess they sold it to Action Church. Action Church is a big power, powerhouse now, it's been here in Winter Springs. It's, it, I think it was meeting at Winter Springs Middle School for about and so they, they bought this building. Well, from what I understand, and I haven't gone, and I will not go, I will not step foot into that building unless I'm really, you know, powered up for warfare. Um, from what I understand, they are super postmodern, really, really postmodern. And I don't, I, if I were to go there, I wouldn't recognize what they're doing. I don't think I would because their worship time are effectively concerts. Uh, they, 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 you know, I don't want to cry them down, but it's definitely not what I know as church life. All right? you, you walk in there with your Bible. <laughs> just, they'd laugh me out at it. People would give me looks. Uh, you know, you understand, so that is legalism, but like you said, it's flipped upside down. It's a different type of legalism. So you, you take, you know, you take someone from the early era of the, of the Pentecostal movement, early 1900s, I mean, that, that's, when, that's when you had the fire and brimstone preachers, right? But what were they? They were simply preaching the word of God in a sense of conviction, with a sense of conviction. They were not fire. Maybe there were some guys that were out there instilling fear, using fear tactics, and so on, yes. But by and large, some of the great preachers from that era, they were just anointed men who, who were preaching the word of God uncompromisingly. Well, you take one of those guys and pop them into Action Church today, and what do you, how, how do you think they would react? Well, I feel like I would react the same exact way. I, I'm convinced that I would, and why is that? What's the factor that dis distinguishes me, that differentiates me from what's happening over there? What is the factor? This is the Word of God, because you, I think you all know me. I'm uncompromisingly Word of God. And the preachers of the early era of the, of the Pente Pentecostal revival were all uncompromisingly the Word of God. They dressed differently. They spoke differently, but the message was more or less the same. So legalism is still very much alive, even in the postmodern evangelical church. I don't know if they, do they want to be called evangelical anymore? I'm not sure what they want to be called. Uh, who knows? Who knows anymore? What was that? They don't want to be Baptists. They used to be First Baptists of Oviedo. Now they're Cross Life. You know, I guarantee you 10 years from now, cross life will not suffice, and they'll have a different name, something more modern, something more vogue. It's just, it's sad, you know, it's really, it hurts to see Christianity going this, going this direction. What, what is Christianity doing? It is transforming to the way of this world. It is embracing the things of this world and actually allowing the things of this world, the system, the corporate model of this world to transform it. That's a travesty. That's a travesty. And hopefully they will awaken to how much of a travesty it really is. So applicability uh, to Torah today. The Torah, the, the God's instructions, are just as applicable today, even in the postmodern world, as it was at Sinai. The Torah is just as applicable today as it was on the day of Pentecost, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred to the believers in Messiah Jesus, they were Torah observant. And this is something that people need to understand. Paul was Torah observant. He was fully Torah observant. He, he, he made sacrifices 
after he was born again, after he had that incredible born again experience on the road to Damascus, Paul went to the temple to make sacrifices. You find that in the latter part of the book of Acts. He was Torah observant. He observed all the festivals. Towards the end of his ministry, he was committed to come to Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot, one of the three festivals that they were commanded to come to Jerusalem for, uh, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Paul said he was committed. Don't stop me, he said. I'm going. I'm going to Jerusalem. Even though it meant that he might be, he might be arrested or killed, I am going to Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot. That's how committed even Paul was to the Torah. This idea that Paul came along and basically said that we didn't need the Torah anymore is just absurd. A very famous teacher today, the son of uh, Stanley, what's his name? Andy Stanley, Andy Stanley the son of, uh, what's his father's name? Charles. Yes, Charles Stanley. I don't, want to, I don't want to tear him down, but Andy Stanley said some horrible things concerning the Torah, concerning the law of God, the Ten Commandments. He basically stated the, the standard uh, orthodox position, on, Christian orthodox position on the law. It's done away with completely. The only thing we do is fulfill the royal law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, and that's it. And if you do this, it, you're loving God. Now, if I understood, yes, if I understood what Andy said. Yeah, I know. This, is, this has been going on for a long time. Uh, Andy Stanley said that when, it, when you take the Lord, it comes down to only love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and your mind. And what's more important is to love your neighbor because when you love your neighbor, you show that you love God. It's illustrative of the fact that you're loving God the royal commandment and love your neighbor if, you, if you're not someone who's committed to loving God. The rest of the commandments are not rele rele relevant anymore because Jesus did away with them. Now that's an orthodox position. Absolutely. Every church will teach you that. that, that right. Now they, they take Matthew chapter 5 way out of context, and Andy Stanley did that. He, he cited Matthew chapter 5, but only the Beatitudes. In other words, he was saying, now this is what the orthodox position gives us. The Matthew chapter 5 is, from their point of view, speaking on their behalf, is a pivotal chapter in the Bible. It is a transformative chapter in the Bible. I'm going to preach like one of them now. Uh, a transformative chapter in the Bible. Jesus made the point that we need, we need the law no longer because of the Beatitudes. And that's what Matthew chapter 5 is about. That's why he introduced the, the, his sermon with the Beatitudes, making the point that everything I'm going to say is done away with by the Beatitudes. Because the rest of Matthew chapter 5 to 7, further past the Beatitudes, it's all about the law of God. It's all about fulfilling the law of God. Every bit of it, Matthew chapter 5, once you get past the Beatitudes, is his, Jesus' commentary on the law. Now, you can't miss that. But what they do is they don't look at that unless they have to cherry pick from it. They only look at the Beatitudes and they make this point. And this is what Andy, Andy Stanley said, that the Beatitudes is what we're responsible for. And if we can fulfill the Beatitudes, then we're fulfilling the law. Yes. So Andy Stanley is not, Andy Stanley is not doing something that's, that's, you know, different. Everybody's picking on him now because of, you know, social media. And, and there, is, there is a movement that's challenging him. But he's not doing anything different from what from what Hank Hanegraaff and many other people that represent Orthodox Christianity have been doing and saying for a long time. In fact, what I heard Hank Hanegraaff said, and in his book he, he wrote this, he said this in his book, and he said it many times on the air, is that when in Matthew chapter 5, 
Jesus said that you must not hate your brother and that to hate your brother is the equivalent of committing murder and that you must not look upon someone to lust after them because it is the equivalent of adultery. When he said all those things, he was only being ironic. He was illustrating how much you cannot fulfill the law and how much the law is no longer necessary. That's what they say. He was being ironic. Ah, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't believe me. You need to go listen to them and follow their positions. They literally believed that. He didn't actually mean what he said. The Beatitudes takes the place of all of what he said. And that's what Andy said. That's a travesty, right? Because the law of God is the law of God. The law of God represents God's determination of what's acceptable, unacceptable. The law of God, keeping the law of God, the commandments, keeps us. It doesn't redeem us. The law cannot redeem you. That's, that's the important point. And that's what Paul said. By the law can no flesh ever be justified. That's very important for us to understand. The law, Paul also said, is like a schoolmaster. It keeps us. It guides us. It keeps us in, in, in right standing with God. But we're only justified by faith. Only faith can a man be justified by faith. Faith, in, the, in, in this sense, faith as it relates. Now, faith justifies in every sense. On every possible level, faith justifies. Faith pleases God. But as it relates to forgiveness of sin and being reconciled to God, we're talking about faith in the atonement. Faith in the cross. When we have faith in the cross... When we believe that the blood of Jesus remove our sins, that's the basis of being. That's the basis of being justified. Having been justified, Paul said, we are therefore reconciled to God. It's the only way, not by the works of the law. All right. In other words, if you take someone that's oblivious to faith for justification or the law, and you say to them, obey these laws perfectly, just don't even ask why. Just obey the law. You put him in bondage first, right? That's what you're going to do. Immediately, he's in bondage. He's just obeying them because you have, a heavy, you have a heavy hand and you're commanding him to obey it. He's not doing it from his heart. He's just blindly obeying the, the Ten Commandments. He's in bondage. Now, is that going to get him reconciled to God? Is that going to reconcile him to God? Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Definitely not. Necessarily, as it relates to being justified. Because justification is an important step in being reconciled to God. And you can only be justified by faith. Now, if he's obeying the law and suddenly God quickens by the Holy Spirit faith in him, and he begins to apply faith to his obedience then there is righteousness or justification. All right, Paul spoke about the righteousness that comes by faith. He said there is righteousness by the works of the law, but then there is righteousness by faith. This is the righteousness that God is interested in, righteousness by faith. The works of the law keeps you. It keeps you in good standing. It keeps you focused. You break the law, if, 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 if I were to decide I'm going to break the law, what would it do for me? What would, what would it do to me? It will get me outside of God's purpose. It will get me way outside of God's purpose. Right? So keeping, staying within the parameter of God's law keeps me focused and keeps me engaged in the work of the kingdom. It doesn't justify me at all. All right? And so Christianity has taken that to an absurd extent. Yes? Of course, of course the ceremonial laws are not applicable because uh, there's no temple. So those particular ceremonial laws are not applicable. What about, this, what about the Sabbath? Keep my Sabbath and make it holy. All right. Yeah. We're responsible for the Sabbath. Now, within the context of Sabbath, 
the observance, the observance of days, comes the festivals. And if Jesus celebrated the festivals, even, even as a child, he went to Jerusalem every year. I would venture to say that he went to every festival, God's festivals, and even the disciples and the first century church did also celebrate the festivals. Why are we not celebrating the festivals today? Well, I'll tell you why. Because in the year 369 AD, at the church in Laodicea, it was decided by the imperial church, some bishops got together under the auspices of, of uh, Constantinople, and they decided that they can change the days and the laws. They can do away with festivals, change festivals, Jewish festivals is what they refer to them as. And we can change the Sabbath from the Jewish Sabbath to our Sabbath, which is Sunday. So now, what, what, what do we know about the church at Laodicea? What does, what does the book of Revelation tell us about the, the church at Laodicea? You think you are rich. You think you're well off, but you're pathetic. You're poor. You're miserable. You need a hot, no coal. You're lukewarm. And if you don't get your act together, I'm going to spew you out. I'm going to remove the anointing, he said. Well, apparently he did. Because a few hundred years later, two or three hundred years later, they're deciding that God's law can be changed, and they had the authority to do it. So the church at Laodicea never repented, apparently. Didn't heed the word of God, and they continued to be cold. They were spewed out. And so, and so that's, that's what happened. And now the festivals are no longer... It started when it really, it really goes back to when there was a stark division between the Jewish world and the Christian world, the, world the, 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 the sons of Israel and the church. There was a lot of pressure put on that, on that situation because the Roman Empire was bearing down on Israel and the church, if the church would in fact identify with Israel. So if the church would identify with Israel, you were seen as Israel, and you would suffer the same faith as Israel at the hands of the Romans. And so the pressure to separate from the church was immense. Immense, especially in the third, fourth century, because the Gentiles, the church had become so Gentile that they saw no reason to remain identified with Israel. And they believed that observing the Sabbath Observing biblical festivals, being responsible for Torah, was to identify with Israel. And so therefore, to get themselves from under the gun of the Roman Empire, they did away with their need to observe Torah. They did away with their need to be Sabbath observant and, biblic and uh, festival observant. And even today, when you speak to many Christians in the conventional world, about Saturday, they, they would say, oh, that's the Jewish Sabbath. Oh, that's what the Seventh-day Adventists, that's what they do. That's the Jewish Sabbath. The Seventh-day Adventists, they Judaized. And now they're observing the Jewish Sabbath. When you speak to most Christians about the festivals, they say, oh, those are Jewish festivals. Even though the Bible is clear, God said, these are my festivals. Right. So you see, you see the pressure, you see the problem. So, and, 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 and it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly ironic thing because if someone is observing the festivals and the Sabbath, you are, you are condemned in the Christian world as being a heretic, anathema. No hope for you unless you really, really repent quickly, real quickly. Uh, you're definitely going to hell because you are under the law. <laughs> You are under the law, brother, and I tell you what, you're in big trouble because you need to repent real fast. You're anathema uh, for sure. And they will condemn you real quickly for being Torah observant, for observing the Torah, for observing the Sabbath, the, the biblical festivals. Most of Christianity will literally send you to hell. Yeah, 
Yeah. Mm, okay. Well, listen. The same people that will condemn you to hell for being Torah observant and for celebrating the Sabbath, you you can't, for instance, get a chicken sandwich on a uh, from Steak and Shake on a Sunday morning, can you? They're pretty legalistic. They're pretty legalistic. Uh, you can't go to Hobby Lobby on a Sunday to pick something up because they're pretty legalistic. They're legalistic in their own right. And so they would condemn you for being legalistic. You're in bondage under the law, but they are in bondage under their own laws. Now, so if it's a matter of bondage, whose law do you prefer to be in bondage to? Man's law or God's law? But the good news is we don't have to be in bondage under God's law because God didn't intend for the law to be bondage. Observing his law gives us latitude. Observing his law establishes us for the sake of ministry. Observing his law is an empowerment. And so it's problematic if you, if you really stop and take a long, hard look at it. So the law is applicable to us today. How, why would it not be? We talked about the sacrifices. We talked about the sacrifices and their meanings. Last week, that was last, last week's class. I don't think we need to rehash that. Uh, I don't think we need to go back into that. We did take a nice long look at that. Uh, the sacrifices are there effectively for us as we transgress the law. All right. So God gives us the law. He knows very well that we're not perfect lambs and that we're going to transgress, we're going to slip up. And for the sake of the fact that we're not perfect, he provides the sacrifices so that we can be uh, justified. We can, not, not that our sins are justified, but we can be justified by faith in what he has provided. The sacrifices, what we call the sacrifices, or the means by which we can approach God. The word korban really means to approach, to draw near to God. So God has provided the, the means by which we can draw near to him, and when we draw near to him, in that sense, when we make the offering, uh, we're forgiven by faith. It has to be. It's always by faith. So, now, we, what about the, the last thing there that we would look at, and I hope to get this done real quickly so we can finish up our study guides and move on to our history one and two next week, is the question of clean versus unclean. All right. How do we deal with the question of clean and unclean? Now, are we eating shrimp, pork? Are we eating at Thai restaurants? Do we eat under the, under the bondage of a Buddha? You, oh, wait a minute, that's, I, can go to, I can go to a Thai restaurant, even if there is a Buddha, and I can have chicken noodle soup or chicken uh, whatever they, they do. Um, the Thais, they have wonderful soups. The Thai people, they have wonderful soups. Um, pad, pad mao, whatever they call it. But, and so I can go, it's chicken, it's not unclean. But you just sat under a Buddha, an idol, and you ate your chicken soup. Don't you think it's unclean? From God's point of view, it is unclean. Well, no, Hindu gods. They call him what? Which, which is Hinduism, which is Hinduism. From, all, from Hinduism comes all of, those, all of those 
different branches. Buddhism, the Hare Krishna movement, all of the different movements that sent. But, but um, what, what do you have in the Orient? What do you have in the Orient, the southern part of the Orient? Southern China, Cambodia, uh, you know, that whole area over there, into the Philippines even, the Thailand, all that area, is, is a form of Hinduism. They worship the same way, a pantheon of gods. And, and, but in Hinduism, you can choose a certain god to be a devotee of. Like the Hare Krishnas, they choose to worship Krishna only. Buddha was a good Hindu. Buddha was a good Hindu, but most Buddhas would say that they're not Hindus, but they really are Hindus. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's different spirit. But it's the same thing. It comes down to the same thing. So you go to a Thai restaurant, and there's a little figure, and sometimes it's a Buddha, sometimes it's a female Buddha or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you have your little idol thing there, and uh, but you you look at the, you look at their little statue, and there's a glass of orange juice or a glass of water and a banana or a fig, or a, or an orange. What do you think they're doing? Right. So they're offering to idols. They're offering food to idols. This is an idol. Any, any, any God figure, any God figure, okay, all right, so I went, I went to a Hindu, a Hindu uh, restaurant where they serve food from Trinidad, and the woman, the proprietor, she worshipped a Hindu goddess, that was her patron goddess. Now, if you talk to her about her goddess, she would say she's represented either in a painting form or in a statue, but she's really a spirit, a guiding spirit. That, that Hindu goddess is a guiding spirit for her. And so every morning she would get up and she would light incense and do her thing and she would offer foods to her little god. Now in her mind, it's a spirit. The statue or the painting that she would do it in front of is just symbolic. It's the same thing with the Thai. They don't worship the God of the Bible. They worship a, f a false God. And, I'm not, and listen, I'm not, telling you, I'm not telling you about something I do because it's intellectually uh, perceived by me. It's something that the Holy Spirit really convicted me of. With both Chinese restaurants, whenever there's a Buddha, Thai restaurants, Hindu restaurants, I mean, real heavy, heavy conviction he held, he held my feet to the fire. And, and that really goes in conjunction with what the, the Church of Acts, the church in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, what they decided on. They said, do not eat foods that were offered to idols. And Jesus came along now in Revelation chapter 3, 2, and he said to the church at Thyatira, this woman Jezebel is leading my servants to eat foods that are sacrificed to idols. That's what happens at your Chinese restaurant. You know what they do? And this is what the woman told me. And I grew up in a Hindu community. And I know it. Yeah. This is what I was told as a kid growing up in Trinidad in that Hindu community. And it was confirmed again. Whenever there's a puja or a, a Hindu prayer meeting, to initiate the process of feeding the people, they, they do a libation before the God, whatever it is, and until that is done, an incense are, are burnt or prayers are offered up, the incense is symbolic of the prayer, until that is done, no one is to eat. But when that is done, then you can eat. Why? Because you're eating the food necessarily that was offered up. So everything that's eaten is then comes under the umbrella, comes under the... The, I guess you can say the spiritual auspices of that sacrifice. Yeah, that, that is, in my mind, eating foods that sacrifice to idols. Now, if I didn't have a really, really intense conviction of the Holy Spirit, I, listen, I love 
Thai food. <laughs> I got to tell you, I love Thai food, and I also like Chinese food, but it really hurt me to receive that conviction because God was serious about it. And I can't even begin to express to you what he did to me, the Holy Spirit, to get me to understand that he, was, he meant business about that. And I'll tell you why, why it was so intense with me. It was intense with me because he showed me something that was real. I know better. He showed me something relative to eating food, sacrifice to idols that was real, and I began to proclaim it. But then I would run over to, to uh, Thai Villa and get me a nice big bowl of noodles, do a special blessing over it, and it's good. It's ready, ready for consumption, you see. He put up with that for about two or three years until about a year ago he said, enough, don't do it anymore. And he meant it. Uh, so uh, from my point of view, clean and unclean goes beyond just eating shrimp or, or uh, <laughs> eating uh, pork or having a ham sandwich. It goes beyond that because certainly from the standpoint of Jesus, this woman Jezebel, was leading his bond servants to eat foods that were offered up to idols, and God saw that as unclean. Right, so Paul, Paul supports, Paul supports what, we're, what we're talking about. Uh, so Paul says, don't be a poor witness and eat, go eat Thai food. <laughs> <laughs> you may love it, but don't do it. <laughs> but listen, and here, here's where I'm going to get to the most important point relative to this. If you do not have the voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you about going over to Thai Villa, you're not responsible for, for going over there. You understand what I'm saying? It became my responsibility because the Holy Spirit said to me, this is not right in the sight of God. Proclaim it. I've been proclaiming it, but then at the same time, I'm going over there. See, there's a hypocrisy there that God wanted me to be free of. You see, and that's what Paul is talking about, being, being forthright as a witness. And I wasn't a witness in that sense at all. Now, I had to repent of that and I've repented well. I've not, I'm not going back to those places. But, but you see, the point is, if you have faith, in other words, God has instructed you to not eat pork or to not eat shrimp, then you're responsible for it. You've got you to do what he says. Now, if you don't have that word of faith, if he hasn't, if that's not his great concern for you at this point in your development as a believer, then you're not responsible for it. You see, we, we grow as believers, and that was the point in Acts chapter 15. The legalistic believers in Acts chapter 15 wanted to impose Torah upon the new believers, and they had not grown to the extent, they had not developed to the extent that they were ready for, by faith, to embrace anything. And Peter and Paul were basically saying, why put them in bondage? Why, why impose upon them to do things that not even we ourselves could do? And that was the point. And so it has to be by faith. And if someone is not in their walk at an extent where they can put things aside and do away with certain things, then they're not ready for it. But the goal is that, that we would all come to a place of walking in faith before God, and he may never lead you to put shrimp away, but you have to be obedient if there's a conviction. For instance, if you're studying in the Word of God, which we all should be, we all should be doing, and you read, and you read what, what Chris just read for us, and you say, my goodness, look at what Paul just said. Ah, I'm convicted now. 
and a couple of weeks go by and that conviction is still there, it means that the Holy Spirit is working in you. Now you're responsible. <laughs> now you have to deal with it, right? And so I, I shared this before uh, one time. Maybe I shared it last week. I began to understand the meaning of uh, not eating a, a calf boiled in its mother's milk. We talked about this last week. And that became a reality to me. God showed me. He said, he said to me, listen, Abraham ate milk and meat. Why are you considering this when my servant Abraham did this? I said, whoa. And then I looked at the law or the, the ordinance concerning that, and it's, it's misinterpreted, misapplied. Do not boil a lamb as while in its mother's milk. In its, in its mother's milk. A yearling that still weans, still takes milk. And I said, oh, look at that, that's so incredible. And then I wanted to buy a piece of veal and the Holy Spirit stopped me three times. <laughs> three times. I made a beeline, went back for it again and he said, no, put it down. I went back again, he said, no, put it down. And, and now I will not eat veal. If you invite me to your house, I'll give you a good example. Good example. This is what Paul is talking about. I shared that one time with someone in the class. And it, it struck him. Whoa. Veal. And, and he's prone to be, being a little legalistic. And he said, veal, I can't eat veal. And, 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 and so he took my experience and he strongly relegated it to himself. And then one day he comes here to do some work around here and he brings veal. He wasn't thinking. Then he remembered as he brought the veal in a soup, in a stew, that you don't eat veal. And he was condemned. I mean, it was so, so I, I ate some stew. I didn't eat the veal, I ate some stew. Because I'm not condemned, I'm, I'm, I'm carrying a witness. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not con I'm, I don't want to impose, you know, upon him, have him feel like, oh, oh I'm in sin here. And I've got to stay away from veal. He, had, he didn't have the faith for it. I had the faith for it. I didn't eat the veal, but I, I ate some of the stew with rice. I'm not condemned, and he's not condemned as well. Now, if I had said to him, oh, you need to repent. You know, you need to take that veal and get out of here with that veal and repent. Well, what would have happened? He would have been in bondage. <laughs> he wouldn't have touched veal again, and it would have been based on my faith. Right, so... Uh, anyway, so clean and unclean, uh, when, when you consider clean and unclean, you have to consider the right of faith, because the, the right of faith is important. You, anything that's not faith is sin. And you know what? When Paul said that in, in Romans chapter 14, if anything is not of faith, it is sin, he was speaking about this very same subject. This is what he was talking about. Romans chapter 14, that we should do whatever we do should be done by faith. All right? So, let's take a break. We'll come back in 15 minutes. I think there's some, uh, some, some pork chops back there. Uh-huh. And fixes it. And doesn't offer as a sacrifice. I mean, you know. I'll have a I'll have a second helping. <laughs> so, so there, uh, there's a way around. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'd like to find one.
Yeah. Well, no, you pray about it. That's what you do. You pray about it. Yeah. Buddhas, yeah. But you're not eating food. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah, it, it, you're right. You're right. You're right, because they're calling on the spirit or the demon god, the idol, for protection, for blessings, and even for influencing other people that come to the store. Yeah. So, yeah. I know they do. I've, I've listened to a few of their. Yeah, so after yesterday's service, because I actually, I really thought the dry bones was actually going to be the bodies of the Jews, the six million Jews who were killed in Germany. Yeah. I thought that, really, literally. I yeah. always just thought that. And then you brought this up. So he studies about the. Um, in the southeast U.S. Also, so that's covered yeah. this way, too. Southeast, yeah. What he's talking about is here in Florida and also in Georgia, but more so in Florida, you have a lot of descendants of the Spaniards that first came here and the Portuguese that first came here. Many of them were crypto Jews. Many of them were fleeing from um, like Lowell, Lowell, Lowell uh, Lowell's on the mother's, his, the mother's side of Lowell's family, he's from St. Augustine, uh, on, the mother, on his mother's side they were, they were Spanish or descendant from the, so they were more than likely uh, crypto Jews. But you don't have as many here as you do in uh, the Southwest. Yeah. Well, here is why, here is why. When, when the land was divvied up, um, that part of the that part of the the New World, Columbus's fifth journey, there was there was a certain he was a conquistador, but he really wasn't a conquistador. He was a, a Mara, he was a he was a converted Jew who was looking for a place to revert. His name was Louis de Cavallel. Louis de Cavallel, the first the first one, the original senior. He was given a grant of land, which is today's Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, all the way to California. He was granted that land. Within 20 years, he brought over 100 crypto families, 100 converted families, conversos from Portugal, 100 of them. And then, as the, as, the, as, the, as the 1500s went on, more and more families, hundreds of families came over, and they were all, most of them, not, and if not all of them, crypto Jews. And they settled in that area. And the son of Luis de Caballal uh, made full conversion, open full conversion, together with hundreds. Yeah, over there in, in New Mexico, Albuquerque, that area. He made a full reversion a full reversion back to his ancestral faith together with hundreds of leaders in the communities. And he was taken to, to Mexico to the Auto de Fe. In fact, Luis de Caballal Jr., the second one, every Tisha B'Av in the synagogues, his poem is read every time. And in, in, in Messian, in, in, in uh, Sephardic synagogues and even in some Ashkenazi synagogues, they read his poem that he wrote the night before he went to the state. Wow. Well, you know, you were so it's estimated that today there's at least three to four million descendants of the Bene Anusim in the Southwest. Well, 
Massachusetts, yeah. My husband, mm -hmm. De Sousa. His family lived in Massachusetts. Absolutely. De Sousa, let me tell you about the name De Sousa. My mother's maiden name was De Sousa. Uh, the name De Sousa, I, I did a lot of research on that name, De Sousa. A lot of research. Um, hours and hours and hours. I couldn't find anything on De Sousa. De or D meaning from. I'm like, I looked all over a map of Portugal and Spain. There's no place called Sosa. De Sosa, nowhere. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. So in the 7th century, 8th, 7th century, um, the Jews of Sosa, Sosa was still in existence, Persia, still there. Wasn't anything like it was during the time of Artaxerxes, wasn't anything like then, but it, it, Sosa was still there. And Islam had invaded the area. And many of the Jews from Sosa went to Spain. And then crossed over into Portugal, and they became known as the Sosa. What's so funny, because when my second husband and I were dating, I told him jokingly, I just want your name. That's all I want. <laughs> the Sosa? It's Jewish. It's definitely Jewish. Definitely Jewish. In fact, some of the, the first, the, you can look this up, some of the first Sephardic Jews that came to this country, like they built that big Sephardic synagogue in New York, they had the name De Sosa. One of the rabbis, his name was De Sosa. Yeah, De Sosa is a, a Jewish name. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing, and, and more fascinating when you tie it to the, the Valley of Dry Bones that they would come out of their graves. All right, so we're talking about people that were dead to their ancestral faith, to their ancestors, to their ancestral faith, completely dead, but they're coming alive now. It's not a literal grave, it's symbolic, of course, but they're literally coming back from the dead. The testimonials, oh, it's all right. The, the test, they, need, they need to hear this. The testimonials, the testimonials are amazing. From you, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, um, Argentina, uh, Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a huge, a huge hotspot for Bene and Osim activity. Mexico, the Southwest, uh, it's, it's, it's everywhere. And you're talking about hundreds of millions of people. And people are awakening. And it's, it's not something that they're intellectually doing. It's something that's happening in their souls. Like Valley of dry bones, it's happening. To become a believer in Jesus, it happens here. Not mm -hmm. here. So think about, if this is true, that maybe, let's say 10 million, which will represent what percentage of 500 million? Uh, what's that? 10 million. That's 5%? 5%? No, no, yeah, 5%, eh, whatever, 5%. Let's say 10 million are taken out of the graves of a dead, a dead life. And they're brought to their ancestral faith. 10 million. That's a lot of people. There's a, there's a huge halakha, there's a huge halakha debate right now in Israel. Are these converts, should we treat them like converts, or are they returnees? No, that's a huge debate. From my point of view, if I were, if I didn't have Jesus, and I wanted to do what I wanted to do, you know, back in the 1980s, before Jesus revealed himself to me, I wanted to become a Jew because I, my ancestors were Jews. I was ready to convert. I was ready to do whatever it took to, re to re reconnect. But the Bene and Usim are sensitive about that because they don't want to be considered converts. There's a stigma that comes with being a convert. They want to be treated as, as I'm Jewish. My blood is Jewish. My DNA is Jewish. I'm a descendant of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Treat me like, like a descendant. There's a lot of complications. For instance, Ashkenazi Jews. All right. They're converts. We all know that. Ashkenazi Jews, the Ashkenazi movement was a convert movement. 
So many of the people who look very European but are Jewish, they're descended from the converts of Ashkenaz. So the Sephardic Jews, the Bene Anusim, the Sephardic Jews are saying, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. The Ashkenazi Jews can be treated as if they're legitimate Jews, but we, we know we descended, we have all the evidence, the DNA evidence, we have the traditional evidence, we have the history, all those things in our favor, but we have to be converts. And there's a real debate, a real strong, lively debate. But God is doing this. And the debate will be settled. The rabbis will have no choice but to deal with this correctly because God is doing this. He wants to fill the Negev. He wants to fill this whole thing here with these people. So God is going to put it in their heart to want to make Aliyah. It's happening. It's already happening. There are centers, there are centers that are being built to, to absorb them. It's already happening. So consider Ezekiel chapter 37. He says they, 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 stood, they stood as an army. A whole lot. Consider 10 million Bene Anusim in the land of Israel, most of them in the Negev, and another 14, 15 million Jews, all of them returned from the nations. So you're talking about 25 million Jews in the land of Israel. That's the army that God saw at the end of the Valley of Dry Bones. Oh, yeah, I, I, it's an amazing thing. Sure. <laughs> I taught right through the break, so it's okay. Okay, folks, <laughs> so we had a lively discussion about Torah. I think it's good. That's, it's, a good it's a good thing to, to look at these things. The whole issue with clean and unclean again, is a, it's an issue of faith. Someone having a faith conviction about eating or not eating. It's the same way observing the Shabbat. It's the same way with the, you know, you just can't go on blind obedience. It just doesn't suffice. Just doesn't. Yes. And so by the law is no flesh glorified, no flesh justified. The word justified is the word righteous. It's the same word. In the Greek, the, the difference between the two words, but in Hebrew, the word is the same, righteousness and, and justification. Abraham could have responded to God. God said, your son, you, you, your, your descendants will be like the stars of the heaven, the sand of the sea. Abraham could have said, okay. No righteousness. God could have said, you walk, you walk in what I just told you and you'll be all right. And Abraham could have just said, okay, I'm going to do it because you said it. But Abraham believed God. That's the faith factor. And it was attributed to him as righteousness. If we, if we obey the law without faith, there's no righteousness. That's what Paul is talking about. So, so we, 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 we obey the law, but applied to that is the reality of faith, hearing and obeying, and that's where the righteousness comes from. Again, you can take, you can take a, a, someone who has no background in the Bible, 
and put on them the commandments and you literally put it on them and they just kind of blindly walk it out with no faith that doesn't please God at all. It has to, it has to be ap applied in faith. That, you know, that's really the message, the message that Paul gave us you know, by the law, by just obeying the law, can no flesh be justified or righteous, become, become righteous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so I think all of the law is applicable to us, the Ten Commandments, all of it is applicable to us. You take, you take the 613 laws, statutes, and commandments, and you sift them through with a fine tooth comb, and you would find that most of the law, if not maybe two-thirds of the law, are pointing to the Ten Commandments in one form or the other. The others have to do with, with you know, the temple and certain agricultural laws and so on. Of course, they're not, they're, they're not applicable to us. So if you take the Ten Commandments, which are applicable to us, and you fulfill them, right? Then, then you're obeying the law. But let me say this. You're better off obeying the law without faith than breaking the law in faith. You're better off obeying the law without faith than transgressing against the law and having faith. So, so blind faith, in other words, just you program someone like a, like a robot to do or not do, well, that person is better off than the person who knows by faith and does not do. All right. So, but for us as believers in Messiah Jesus, we are to obey by faith. Faith has to be applied to it. Because God expects more from us. He just doesn't want us to be like robots. He wants us to obey because we love him. And so we keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that love application is vital. The one who loves me, he it is that keeps my commandments, my instructions. Well, what Andy, Andy Stanley has done with that is to say, that Jesus gave us a new commandment, and that's what he was talking about. John chapter 13, verse 35, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. And this is how he got to that royal commandment statement, that you love one another. And so if you obey that commandment, you obey all the commandments. But Jesus said, the one who loves me is the one who obeys my commandments, plural. Not just a new commandment, but all of it. So do you see, so you see it, it's obedience and faith must go hand in hand, and that comes from our love for God. So because I love God, I will obey Him. When I talked about, uh, last week, I talked about the orange, my neighbor, neighbor's orange, navel orange experience. All right. What was it that, 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 that was so powerful in me that caused me to walk away from his oranges to begin with? with my love for God. Not just, f not, not fear, but my love for him. And I loved him, I didn't, I didn't want to offend him, I didn't want to, to interfere with our relationship, so I obeyed him. Right. Now if, if I did it, if I heard that and I said, <clears throat> yeah. if that law wasn't there, I certainly would have an orange. But I have to obey it. You see, you, there's a difference in how we apply it. And that's why love and faith, they go hand in hand as it relates to fulfilling the law because we love him. And if you love him, you're going to want to keep his law and fulfill his law. And there's a difference between fulfilling the law and obeying the law. Yeah, absolutely, there's a difference. Now, people are different. 
people are made up differently. So if, if your particular makeup is as you're like, you're like uh, let's say you're someone who you're, you're I'm not sure what, what exact word I'm looking for, but if you're very regimented and you're very, you're given to, to just following, following rules, you know, you're probably military type and then you can apply the law in that way and it doesn't necessarily please God because you're just doing something through compulsion, through a sense of duty. Yeah, it's... All right, so you, you have two men praying in the temple. One, one a publican, the other one a Pharisee. The Pharisee is keeping the law. He's obedient to the, to the law. The publican isn't. But the Pharisee has a problem. Because he's keeping the law, his heart isn't right because he's proud. He's basically saying, I'm accepted before God because I routinely keep the law. I'm in line. And I'm okay with God. I'm not like old publican over here who can't keep the law. Well, the publican beats his chest and says, God, forgive me. I can't keep your law. Help me. And Jesus said, which one of these two walked away justified? The publican. Even though the Pharisee was obedient to the law, he crossed his T's and he dotted his, his I's. He did everything he was supposed to do. He was the robot, but he was the robot with an attitude. <laughs> A poor attitude. You see, so we can be like that. We can be like that, yes. And this is the point to legalism that I, I observe in many, many people and I've, I've observed over the years, they're like robots as it relates to the law. But they're robots with poor attitudes. They don't have faith. They're not, and, and they become legalistic and judgmental at the same time. Uh, it's, it's a, how could it not be an issue? <laughs> it's an issue. Anyway, but it's, it's, a, it's a broad subject. On the other side of the subject, on the other end of the argument, you have... Unfortunately, people that are saying, all you have to do is love your, you know, a new commandment, and that's all, you, that's all you're responsible for. The rest of it is you're not responsible for. <laughs> so, very sad. And Andy Stanley is taking a beating on the internet, but the, 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 the pale of Orthodox Christianity supports him. The house of Orthodox Christianity supports him. He's right from their point of view. Uh, so it, it's, it's a deep subject, and we need to move on to our study guides. Otherwise, we'll be doing this again next week. Don't want to do that. So where are we? Who's keeping track of the study guides? Study guide 3, section, section 2, 6. Is that right? I'm believing it. I'm ready to move on here. We can do this, by the way. We can do it. Uh, a study guide and a half. We can do this. All right, so in Moab, who is Moab, by the way? Who is Moab? Cousin, cousin of Israel. Uh, Moab was one of the sons of Lot, Ammon and Moab. All right. So in Moab, Israel defeated Shihon the Amorite. <laughs> I gave it away. Israel defeated the Amorite. Okay, so, so the Amorite is one of the, the Canaanites that God mentioned in Ezekiel and Revel in Genesis. Genesis chapter 15, God said to Abraham, your descendants will come into the land when the sin of the Amorite is complete. So they began. That, that was the first set of battles that Israel fought. They fought against the Amorites. All right, they also defeated Someone at Bashan. Og at Bashan. Og at Bashan. All right, so today in Israel, and, and some people will agree with me, some people will not agree with me, but this is not a, a make or break um, statement. In other words, my salvation doesn't hinge on this. Uh, they found in the northern part of, of, the, of the Jordan, the northern part of the Jordan, uh, in this area right here, uh, it's called Gilgan Bashan. 
today in, in, in Israel. This area right here, which is just south and east of uh, the Galilee, this is the region of Og of Bashan. And this area is called Gilgan Bashan. They found a stone structure with what appears to be a tomb right in the middle of it uh, that's about 20 feet long. And so they speculated that that stone circular structure was the, the ancient tomb of Og. Uh, because there is what seems to be a, a lay, a, a, a platform for a body that's about 20 feet long. The Bible tells us that uh, Og of Bashan was about 18 feet tall. Now, some archaeologists dismiss this altogether because they dismiss the Bible narrative. They don't receive the Bible narrative on the basis of faith. And so they, they kind of refuse to believe that this is actually the tomb of Og of Bashan. But it's in the region of Gilgan Bashan, right where Og was. And there is that other archaeological evidence to indicate that that was probably the tomb of Og of Bashan. Og, who was Og? Og was the ruler of Bashan. He was a, he was a giant, a Rephaim, a giant. 18 feet tall, I would say so, right? Um, this ceiling, I think from, from, from floor to the peak of the ceiling, it's probably about 20 feet. No, not even that. Probably 18 feet. Less than 18 feet. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and, and the older you get, is the taller it is. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think this is like, probably this is like uh, yeah, close to 18 feet. So consider Og of Bashan. He was that tall. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. All right, someone had a question, a comment about Og of Bashan? No. All right, so Og of Bashan was um, defeated by, by Moses. Moses was involved in that defeat. Uh, the sons of Israel defeated Og of Bashan. Moses was the, the, the guy at the time. How did Balak, king of Moab, attempt to com combat Israel? To bring a curse upon Israel. I think we talked about this quite a bit. Did we look at the story of Balaam and Balak? Briefly, we didn't spend a lot of time on it. I think we know the story well, right? The story of Balaam and Balak. Balaam was a prophet for hire. He was from Mesopotamia. He was well known as a, a, a capable anointed prophet. Balak was a Moabite. He was the king of Moab. He sent all the way from Mesopotamia for... Balaam. And Balaam's mission was to curse the children of Israel. And, uh, and, and Balaam, would, would, Balaam, in order to curse the children of Israel, would to appeal to the God of Israel for the curse, which didn't work. In fact, every time he attempted to curse Israel, he would proclaim a blessing upon Israel, until ultimately uh, Balaam gave up and he went back to Mesopotamia. But then what happened was Later on, he finds himself all the way back in the region of Moab, and he succeeds in bringing Israel to a place where they would sin against God and bring upon themselves a curse, which is exactly what happened. And the story there is very important. We are not to be cursed. People cannot curse us if we remain in the parameters of God's will, God's law. Israel transgressed against God's law, his will, and they became susceptible to curses. And that's the story of uh, Balaam. Very sad story. All right. Why did Balaam's, Balaam's donkey speak to him? <laughs> because he was a donkey. Balaam was being a mule, and God had something important to say to him, and he wasn't listening. He was being mule-headed, so God used a mule to speak to him. And, and, and of course, the mule was ordained or, or, or appointed to do that. God opened the mouth of the mule, and the mule spoke to him. The mule saw the angel of the Lord standing there, preventing him to go 
to go. He was probably in the Jordan Valley somewhere, coming down the valley, headed down to, to uh, Moab, and the mule stopped dead in his tracks and says, I'm not going. You can beat me as much as you want. I'm not going. All right. Let's move on. What are some of the points of the prophet, of the prophecy that Balaam spoke concerning Israel? Israel will be a people set apart, will not be counted with the other with the, with the, with the nations. They would be a multitude, and God will, will raise up a Messiah in their midst. They would be blessed, and no one will be able to curse them, but they themselves can bring a curse upon themselves. That's the story. That, that's, that's what we see. All right, let's move on. Eventually, even though Balaam could not directly curse Israel, he did suggest to Balak that Israel would bring a curse upon himself through harlotry. So by breaking of the law, transgressing God's law and going against God's will, Israel brought a sin or brought a curse upon themselves. And it's believed that this was Balaam's brainchild. Why do we believe that? Because... Balaam is back, he left for Mesopotamia. But then when the situation at Baal Peor happened, which is where Israel transgressed against God with harlotry, Balaam was found among the dead. Balaam came back and he brought this, he brought this uh, effective curse or, or way by which he can effect a curse upon Israel, which is through the flesh. And that can preach. That can really preach because even though he couldn't curse Israel through the weakness of the flesh, Israel would bring a curse upon themselves. And the story goes on beyond that, of course, there's, there's, a, there's a, the presentation of faith with, with Pincus, Phineas. Phineas took action, faith and action. Phineas took action. And he stayed the, the result of they breaking the law, transgressing against God's will. The result of it was the curse, the curse that they brought upon themselves. And Phineas, by faith, he stopped the curse. His faith, his faith action uh, caused, caused God to hold back. And, and so God, God gave Phineas a special name among the sons of Israel. He, he was a Kohen. Uh, he was a priest, of course. All right, let's move on. I think, I, think I, I, really need to do, I really need to do justice to the story, and I can't do it in just a couple of minutes. All right, so let's see. Mm. Whom did God choose to succeed Moses? We know it well, uh, Joshua. Joshua, his name was Yahushua which means, of course, God is salvation. God will bring salvation, Yehoshua. What three tribes took a possession on the east bank of the Jordan? All right. And why? Why did, they, why did they do this? The land over there was lush. It was green. It was that. Uh, that now, it's not that today, of course, but in ancient times, it was. It, it's the, the land has transformed a lot in the last four millennia, three, three and a half millennia. But it was lush. It was green, and, and so it was good for them and their flocks and so on. So they chose land on the east side of the Jordan. Um, I would contend. I would. I would take the position that they didn't belong on the east side of the Jordan. Moses allowed them to stay over there, but they should not have been there. They should have been on the east side, the west side of the Jordan. Ultimately, all of that land would be given to Israel. But for the sake of the conquest of the land, the taking of the land, all of Israel should have been on the mountains of Judea and Samaria. And that's where they were supposed to be until the conquest of the land was complete. Uh, Gad, Reuben, and Manasseh uh, faltered quite a bit because of that. So what was their commitment relative to, the, to conquering the land of Israel? They would lead the other tribes uh, to the west side until they got the land and they would 
right? So they would participate in the process of the conquest, but their home would be across the river, which created a bit of a logistical problem. And what, why a logistical problem? Because every time there was a conflict on the west side of the Jordan, up the mountain and across the, 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 the mountain top, they would have to cross the Jordan, and crossing the Jordan with an army wasn't something that was easily done. Uh, at that at that time, you understand me. They, with a with a huge army, how could you cross? You, you can't cross the Jordan. You know, perhaps the level of the Jordan was higher at that time. I think it certainly was, uh, and it was deep. You can't just, you know, chariots or not chariot chariots, but horsemen and and armies. It's a process. It take time. You had to ford the river or whatever you did to get over, and it would, it, by the time you get over and up the mountain, the battle's already over. Yeah. So then they didn't need to be on the east side of the Jordan, they needed to be together with the rest of the tribes of Israel for quick response, and they, they yeah, it created a problem, for sure. What did God warn the Israelites concerning the Canaanites? Did I miss one? Yes, I did. No, I didn't. What did God warn the Israelites concerning the Canaanites left living in the land? Thorn, there would be thorns in their sides that would create trouble for them. And, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, because they did not rid the land of the Canaanites, which is what God wanted them to do, the Canaanites became stumbling blocks to them. Uh, we talked about the, the form of worship that the Canaanites had. They worship principally three gods, the El, the Baal, and the Ashtara, and that type of, that system of worship was very appealing to the flesh. The worship of Baal and Ashtara involved, uh, involved uh, prostitution, very strong in the flesh, and the children of Israel would yield to it invariably. And so they became, they became susceptible, susceptible, a subject to the Canaanite gods. How many cities were designated for the Levites? 48, they were called refuge cities. How many, how many cities of refuge uh, were there to be for manslayers? Six. So six of, the, six of the refuge cities were for people who committed manslaughter. All right? All right, last study guide, which I believe we can get this done in 20 minutes. Oh, study guide, we do Torah 2. Section 1, in what year of the journey did Moses bring the message of Deuteronomy to Israel? 40th year. What were the boundaries of the land outlined by Moses? Well, I guess, I guess we can go read it. It's in uh, chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, verse 7. But we basically, we know, that we know the boundaries fairly well. Describe the borders of the territory given to Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Can you find these boundaries on, a ma on, on, the, maps, on the maps today? Uh, Gilgal, Bashan. All right. Gilead, Bashan, excuse me. So you're talking about this area here, all the way up, north of the Galilee, even into the Golan, all the way down on the east side of the Jordan, Gad, Manasseh, and Reuben. Very mountainous, uh, very mountainous region. In the, ancient, in the ancient world, it was very fertile. Why and what does Moses ask God for? and was denied. Moses wanted to, to enter into the land. He wanted to see the land. He wanted to touch the land. And God said, no, you will not go because you've rebelled against me. All right. So why does Moses say that the nations will see Israel as a wise and understanding people? Right, because they are observant to the law. And that is another factor of the law that we didn't talk about. Obeying God's law puts us in a place of having God's mind. Yes, 
when you obey the law of God, when you, when you fulfill the law of God, you have the mind of God. The only person really, the only people that can really fulfill the law of God are those who has the mind of God. You, your, your fulfillment of the law has to do with knowing God's mind. Why does God say you should not do thus and so? What is, what is his intentions? And so when you fulfill the law, you're, you're, you're given the mind of God. If you have the mind of God, you're definitely wise. Wise beyond yourself. And so it is with Israel. Israel, if they would keep the law, they would be elevated as a people. God will reflect through them. The persona of God will be seen through them. When God spoke to Israel, they saw no form, right? No form, only a voice. Moses said that the Lord your God is a, a consuming fire and a jealous God. How do we deal with that from a very Christian perspective, from a very Christian point of view? How do we deal with the fact that God is a consuming fire? The God of the New Testament is different. Yeah, he's, he's, not, manevol he's not benevolent. He's benevolent. Uh, he's a different God. The God of the Old Testament, it's, it's, it, it, basically uh, Jesus in going to the cross appeased the God of the Old Testament and he became more gentle, more kind, appeasement. He appeased God. That's, that's pretty, pretty bad. Uh, that's really bad doctrine right there. Jesus, now it says in, in, uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 53 that it pleased God to bruise him. And to see his life as an offering, that's what it says. You can't get around that. That's what it says. Now, it doesn't mean that when Jesus went to the cross, he appeased the angry God of the Old Testament, and therefore, because the angry God of the Old Testament was appeased, then he's gentler, he's kinder, he's, he's, like, he's like the dragon. He's like, you know, you saw the King Kong movie, right? You saw that King Kong movie? How many? There were six of them. All right, so what happens? The, the people of the island... In order to keep King Kong pretty, pretty much calm and under control, they would have to offer up a virgin to Kong, right? They had an apparatus. They would put a virgin on, on there, and Kong will come and snatch the virgin away or the woman, who, whatever. The offering, the appeasement. And that would keep Kong happy for, for a while until he gets, you know, itchy again, and he'll come back. That's appeasement. Well, that's kind, of, that's kind of the way that God is portrayed, the Old Testament God. To keep him happy, there had to be an offering. And Jesus was that offering, and so now the Old Testament God is now kind of, he's happy, he's appeased. Once and for all, of course, but he's happy now. Well, that's just unfortunate, because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. There's no difference. He, he himself hasn't changed. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a consuming fire today as he is a consuming fire, as he was a consuming fire then. He hasn't changed. What has happened is an atonement has been made that men might be forgiven of their sins. And not just sins after the cross, but the sins that existed before the cross were atoned for at the moment of the cross. Nothing changed with God. God had that plan from the very beginning. All right, so God is not King Kong or a dragon living in a cave somewhere where you have to present before the dragon a damsel in distress every six months or something to keep the dragon in the cave. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Old Testament is, in fact, the God of the New Testament. He is the one and only God. He is the God and father of Jesus who gave his life, that we might have life. It's that simple. All right. But he is a consuming fire. What does Moses tell Israel will happen if they act cor corruptly and make idols? They'll be driven out into the nations. That's very, very, very early. 
briefly in, in Moses' sermon, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses makes that point very clear that they would be driven out of the nations because of their sins. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, is called the Shema. All right. It's basically, you know, the Shema here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He is Echad. So, so listen, they ought to listen here, O Israel. Shema. Uh, this, this is considered the cornerstone of Judaism and is heard in every synagogue service. God commanded Israel to bind the commandments on their hands and on their foreheads. This is, this is the orthodox practice of putting on tefillin, phylacteries. And, and of course, zitzis are along the same, the same way. So I often like, to, I often like to, to think about the people, the Christians that are, that are messianic types or, or Hebraic root types, that are very legalistic. I, I wonder if they're wearing tefillin, and I wonder if they go to that extent. I prob probably they don't. You know, because according to, according to the Torah, you're supposed the man of Israel is supposed to wear the phylacteries and and the tefillin. Yes, so. The phylacteries, tefillin. The zitzis is, of course, you know what the zitzis are. Tassels, zitzis, yeah. Zitzis. Yeah, zitzis. All right. So, let's see if we can move along here. Mm -hmm. I distracted myself. That's terrible. Where am I? <laughs> All right. Seven. Seven. A simulation has always been one of the greatest threats. To the Jewish people, note the laws listed in chapter 7, 2 to 5, and the reason for them. Uh, to, to, to remain a unique and a called out people, Israel had to, 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 to not take, take um, you know, husbands or wives of the nations. Uh, simulation is a, is a big problem, always has been a problem, um, and, and that's, that's, that's ongoing even to today. A simulation today is, uh, is, is a big problem in the Jewish world. Uh, some would say it's a bigger problem today than it was in history, and I would say perhaps yes. More Jewish people are turning away from their ancestral faith, and there, there's a lot of intermarriage. The rabbis and the communities are really grappling to bring this under control. Uh, they're always, they've, they've been doing that for a long time. They've had a better, a better handle on it when people were religious. When the Jewish people were by and large religious, they had, they, they had a better handle on the assimilation problem. Today, especially in the West, in this country, Jewish people are much less religious and much more susceptible to assimilation and, in fact, becoming completely lost in their identity. Well, I think that's definitely one of the 613 laws, statutes, and commandments. It will be a statute, I think. Ordinance. Yes. Well, you know, the, like I said, some people want to be ultra-legalistic and they want to do all those things. But when it comes to this, they tend to bypass this altogether because it's quite involved. You, you, wrap, you wrap the tefillin around your hand and you bind your hand with the law. The law is in there. You put it on your forehead. They, they, 
the little black box that they put on their forehead as they pray. Now, that's for Israel to do, and they ought to literally do it. It's like with the Zitzis. The Holy Spirit convicted me about wearing Zitzis and said, I am your Zitzi. So how does that compare? How does that relate for me in regards to, to, to phylactery? Well, the Word of God is always my strength. And that's the point to the phylactery. You bind your right hand with it. It's your hand of strength. In, in, illustrating that the Word of God is your strength. The Word of God is always my strength. The idea of putting it on your forehead, what, is, what does that symbolize? It symbolizes that the Word of God is always in my, my mind. It's always before me. It is that important to me. It's right here. So for me, the Word of God is just that. I don't have to wear a box on my forehead or wrap my hand with a strip of leather to illustrate that. So, Yeah, a mezuzah is what you're referring to. I have a mezuzah in my house. I can take it off. It's, my, it's not going to make much of a difference, really, because I believe that my house is covered by, by, the, by, by the blood of Jesus. It's covered. And if there is a mezuzah on there, I'm just sort of being obedient, I guess, in a traditional way. But I can live without the mezuzah. It's, it's, it becomes, uh, like here, we have mezuzahs on the doors. It's sort of an expression of identity with Israel. Our buildings will not fall apart if we take the mezuzahs down. The enemy will not come rushing in if we take the mezuzahs down. The enemy will come rushing in if, we, if we're not careful about our faith and we're not believing for a blood covering, God's covering over even the buildings. The sanctuary. The great witnesses do your house. Yeah, yeah. I guess someone comes to your door and you, what is that? You can exp you can tell them what it is, and you have your opportunity to share with them beyond beyond it being a physical object hanging on your door. You'll have the opportunity to share with them more completely. Um, it's never been a, a witness for me. People ask and they look at you kind of strange. And they say, well, are you Jewish? No, I'm not Jewish. Well, why, what? Okay, and so they, they walk away confused. Um, you have a cross where? Okay, if, if, if you went home tonight and the cross wasn't there, would it change anything? No. Okay. So then that's just shot. Then what it's really supposed to be. It can be an object of faith. And objects of faith, no, yeah. Okay, so the cross around, you, some people wear identifiers, a cross. A zitzi or a yarmulke, or they're, they're identifiers. All right, so if you're wearing a cross, it is supposed to symbolize that you're a Christian, right? All right, and so you can rely on that to exhibit your Christianity all the while you're acting like a devil, and what are you doing with your testimony? You're wearing a cross, but you're in the flesh. I've seen that many times. I'm not saying you are. But, but you see, so the cross is just an identifier, but what, what should really identify you is your action in the Holy Spirit.
Mm -hmm. The cross, the cross doesn't help you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What God or your Lord has for me to follow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes I don't know whether I am or I'm not. So I don't know. I mean, I pray to God every morning. I pray to Him all the time. I want to know is how am I supposed to know if He's listening? Am I supposed to have a gut feeling or a sense in me that says, okay, God's listening? All right. You can you can you can put up crosses, or you can have objects of faith around your house, yeah. you know, and that can give you a sense of connection with God. But you're you're wanting something beyond that. You're wanting something that really confirms to you that you're connected to God. The objects are just that objects. They're not going to do that. So put those aside. You have to buy faith know that you're accepted by God. It has to be an issue of faith. And I don't think you fully understand the dynamics of faith, how faith works. I I, right. And so that's something that you need, to, you need to learn. And so that's something we can work on. The, without faith, it's impossible to have that sense of being right with God. It's impossible to please God without faith. So faith... Faith, in your case, would be knowing that because of what God has provided, which is appropriated in my life, the blood of Jesus, I am, I am okay for a good relationship with God. I'm in a place where I can have a good relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. You have to believe that and you have to act upon it and whenever, whenever that voice comes along and says, you don't have a relationship with God, you have to reject it. And you have to respond by faith, and, and you have to say, no, I do have a right relationship with God because the blood of Jesus has covered my sins. So in your case, there's a, there's a need for crucifixion of, of, of flesh, laying down of the strong man that will lead you away into places of doubt, and error, faith. All right, we can we can come back to that. Ah, where, where did we stop? Seven. Seven. Nine. Simply stated, what did Moses tell Israel? Okay. All right. Is it ten? Where am I at? Nine. Okay. You have to forgive me. I have tinnitus, and this room just triggers it every time. I don't hear like I should. All right, so simply stated, that's where we need to be. Is that nine in your material? That's eight in my material. Is it okay? So God said to Israel, "What is it? What?" said to Israel that it is not for your righteousness or for your uprightness uh, of, of heart that you will possess their Canaanite land, but it is, it is because of the wickedness of the nation. So simply stated, God said, you're not going to inherit the land because of your good works, but because of the fact that the inhabitants of the land are wicked, and I want you to be righteous and to be upright, but that's not why you're getting the land. So it's, that's, that's what he said in chapter 9. Okay, so simply stated, what did Moses tell Israel that God required of them? Hmm. Anyone? That's found also in the prophets as well. All right, note that Moses exhorts Israel to circumcise their hearts. What is the implication of this statement for those who say that the Jewish relationship to God is not by law, is by law, excuse me, and the church relationship is by grace? So God is, is calling on Israel, or Moses is calling on Israel to have a circumcised heart. 
It's no different with us. God expects us to have a circumcised heart as well. So the relationship with God and Israel is based on the same reality as the relationship that we have with God. It's always by faith. A circumcised heart, you know, Peter said concerning the Gentiles that were coming into the church in Acts chapter 15, that they were being cleansed, their hearts, they were being cleansed by faith. In other words, their hearts were being made right by faith. And so they had circumcised hearts by faith. And, and that's the only way really that someone can have a circumcised heart by faith. All right, let's see if we can move on here now. Um, all right, so note that Moses exhorts Israel. So 11, the eyes of the Lord, we're going to read right through, the eyes of the Lord God is always on the land of Israel. Now, that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11 is an important chapter as it relates to God's love for the land. He, he indicates in 11 that he loves the land. The land is his land. He said, you are but sojourners on that land. Section 3, real quickly. Israel obeyed God. If Israel obeyed God, what position uh, would they hold relative to the nations? Yeah. We read that when we looked at the covenant. What were the two mountains on which the altars were to be built? Ebal and Gerizim, which is in the land of Israel, at Shechem. What were the conditions leading to the blessings? Obedience. If you obey the Lord, it will go well with you. If you don't obey the Lord, it will not go well with you. What were the conditions leading to curses again? Uh, if you don't obey God, you will have a curse. Notice the description of the wandering Jew. In 28, chapter, six, chapter 28, verse 65 to 67, uh, the wandering Jew there is the Jew who has disobeyed God and, who, and, has been, and has been driven out into the nations. Eventually the Lord will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants to love the Lord your God. That's found in chapter 30. Now, that's also repeated in the prophets, that God will, in fact, do this wonderful thing, and all of Israel would obey God. Life and what? Life and prosperity, death and adversity had been set before Israel. So blessings and the curses. Who was chosen to succeed Moses? Yahushua or Joshua. How was the anointing symbolically transferred to him? By the placing, the, by the laying on of hands. After the book of the law was written, it was placed in the, the golden box, the Ark of the Covenant. Moses would die outside of the land on Mount, Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is on the, on the east side of the Jordan for the south, but on the east side of the Jordan, I guess you can go to Mount Nebo today. I, I'm not sure how the Jordanians feel about people going to Mount Nebo, but Mount Nebo is there. And you can see Mount Nebo, I believe you can see it from the Dead Sea, uh, northern part of the Dead Sea. So that's where Moses is buried. Some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant is hidden somewhere on Mount Nebo as well. How old was Moses when he died? How was his health condition? He didn't die of old age. He, he died by the word of God. God told him to go die. Time to die. And he died. The Bible says that his strength was, was intact. He was fully, fully in, in, like a young man at the moment of his death, and God told him, it's time to die, go up on Mount Nebo and die. Same thing happened with uh, Aaron. God said to Aaron, it's time to die, go up on Mount Hur and die. And, Moses, and Aaron went and he died. Listen, when I die, I want to go like that. Uh, you know. Huh? I 
can, I can envision Moses being fully healthy like a 40-year-old man. He walked up to the top of the mountain. He sat down, closed his eyes. He died. <laughs> Dying is easy, resurrection, though, that's, that's tough. <laughs> It makes no it makes it makes no difference than him simply sitting on a rock, laying over and dying, than a Canaanite killing him. The death is the same. God chose for him to just sit down and die, or stand up and die, lay down and die, however he did it. God gives listen, Tab, God gives life and he takes life. And when he takes my life, I wanted to go something like that. I'm healthy, I'm working, and all of a sudden, it's time, and I lay down, and I die. Yeah. Let me say this to you. Death is not natural. Yeah, death is never natural. We were not designed to die. 